it connect, it, it essentially, we took the system and uh, limited it to two levels, um, despite the fact that we know that there are much more than that. So essentially, one of the ideas was that uh, these two levels um, can be isolated because uh, um, uh, there is a clear resonance. Uh, so once we come with the light which is in resonance with the transition between some two level system between the, for example, ground state and certain excited state, then the system will be driven by this resonant interaction and the presence of all other uh, complexity of uh, energy structure uh, has no influence on the system. Um, it's, uh, so we didn't say actually, uh, so until now we know uh, that um, there is some energy structure of, uh, of an atomic, uh, of, a, of an atom, there are several you know, different uh, types of uh, splittings and so on and so forth. So we never discussed uh, uh, the subject of uh, a, what is the energy width of a certain level? Um, we never talked about uh, the possibility that atom, by some reason, so the electron that occupies certain uh, orbital, uh, will actually change this orbital and go spontaneously to a, to a different orbital. It's not a part of the model, so uh, until now we used uh, different uh, parts of the Hamiltonian, so we wrote uh, different uh, types of the Hamiltonians. So the first Hamiltonian was the uh, interaction between uh, two uh, charged particles, proton and electron. So it's a Coulomb interaction. So the solution of this Coulomb problem is the uh, different uh, structures, uh, some, some structure of energy <laughs> levels. So uh, there is nothing that actually uh, say about uh, transitions between different levels. Um, so all these levels are energy states of the Hamiltonian. So if you put your electron on a certain orbital, it will stay forever there. If the Hamiltonian that we consider is this Hamiltonian. So I mean, if the world that we are living in provide us with this Hamiltonian, which takes into account uh, only interaction between uh, proton and electron, which is the Coulomb interaction, then electron, whatever the uh, orbital is, this orbital will be stable forever. Or any energy level is the eigen uh, energy level of the Hamiltonian, and it, once electron occupy this orbital, it will stay forever there. That's one thing to understand. And no type of the Hamiltonian until now that we considered actually provide any solution to this problem. Um, it's not in a spin orbital uh, coupling, which is uh, uh, the result of relativistic uh, motion of the electron. Uh, nothing in the relativistic uh, Hamiltonian will provide this type of uh, a answer to this question. Nothing in uh, other type of the Hamiltonians, like spin-spin uh, interactions, like is nuclear spin with the electronic spin, will also provide uh, answer to this question. So then the question is, then, you know, if we put the electron in a certain orbital, if it will stay forever there. Um, you cannot say that uh, you know everything in nature goes to a lower energy, and that's the reason why uh, the electronic orbital, which is the uh, you know uh, not the ground state of uh, uh, of the system, then uh, the electron will decay to a ground state just because of the fact that there is a uh, ground state in the system. So there is an energy level which is lower than the excited energy level. That's not the reason. So at least uh, you can say these words, but there is no mathematical uh, uh, statement, or you, can, you cannot prove that mathematically 
based on models that we used uh, until now. So it's not in our model, this, uh, this decay. So um, those of you who, who were here at 9 o'clock, I suppose that uh, we discussed with you uh, a certain model that uh, provide you uh, with a clue of uh, how to deal with this problem. So essentially that's the question of uh, coupling between uh, something else. So he described a model of uh, a discrete level that is coupled to continue. So that uh, gives uh, a certain lifetime to, pro to, to, to the energy level. So where, where this continuum comes from, right? So what is this uh, missing part of the Hamiltonian that uh, we didn't consider yet? So this missing part of the Hamiltonian is the uh, interaction between dipole of the electron, dipole of the atom, atomic dipole, and uh, uh, the uh, vacuum of the electromagnetic field. So we don't need electromagnetic field for this. Uh, uh, for this interaction to happen. So uh, the electromagnetic field is, is not necessary, so we do not need to introduce the electromagnetic field in order to uh, this uh, interaction to happen. We only need to have electromagnetic vacuum. That's the part of the Hamiltonian we didn't consider yet. We will not consider that in this part of this, so in this course. This is part of uh, a uh, usually of the uh, third quantum uh, mechanics, uh, of the advanced course of quantum mechanics, where uh, you quantize the electromagnetic field and then you observe, uh, or you come to the conclusion that the electromagnetic vacuum is not empty. So it has some energy. And so having some energy means that the uh, Hamiltonian, or the interaction between the dipole of the atom and the electromagnetic vacuum is non-zero. So it has some value, and this value uh, uh, brings to uh, 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 to the solution uh, to this problem. So the atom actually, so the electron leaves certain time on the excited state before being uh, dumped down to a ground state. So in the ground state, uh, the coupling of the ground state to an electromagnetic uh, vacuum is inefficient because Electromagnetic vacuum cannot provide that much energy you know, to excite the atom to the excited state. So the lifetime of the ground state is essentially infinite. But the excited state uh, can uh, decay to the ground state, but this decay is essentially due to the additional part of the Hamiltonian. And this additional part of the Hamiltonian is the interaction between the dipole of the atom and the electromagnetic ground, electromagnetic vacuum. So this is, this is not a very simple, uh, you know, it's, it's a simple idea that was uh, essentially known you know, during the whole history of, uh, well, 20th century physics. Um, it was known as well, you know, you see that atom, so if, if you excite atom, it's fluorescence and gives you a, a light back, so it scatters photons. Um, but, uh, in order to uh, be able to describe this uh, effect uh, correctly, uh, um, it, it took some time you know, to, uh, um, to arrive at the correct description in the, in the language of quantum mechanics. And this correct uh, description actually required the quantum electrodynamics, or quantization of the electromagnetic uh, field. So as I said, uh, I, I'm not going to tell you about this uh, model, so it's not, uh, it's not the part. Essentially, in this course, I'm not uh, using a uh, second quantization of electromagnetic field. So electromagnetic field is sort of classical variable for us. Um, therefore, um, this uh, decay uh, process uh, of atoms from uh, so of the electronic orbital, which is not a ground state, so the decay of this uh, electronic uh, orbital back to a ground state orbital, um, will be considered only phenomenologically. So I know it should happen, so I plug it in uh, by force. So that's what physicists can do, right? So that's just one of the ideas that, uh, you know, if we are not mathematicians, so not always have to go uh, through a very uh, 
you know, perfect route, uh, presenting every single step by uh, a very uh, uh, rigorous proof that it should be there. So we know it should be there, so we plug it in uh, phenomenologically. So of course uh, you will be, uh, so following the, uh, the relevant course, you will be able to, uh, to find uh, uh, the correct uh, description of this uh, model. Um, but I want to start today from uh, presenting the model that was uh, used by Einstein so in, the, uh, in the very beginning of this uh, you know, uh, story of uh, quantization of uh, electromagnetic field. So the idea here is just to present uh, the interaction between the atom and the broadband light. So once the Einstein, when Einstein uh, introduced this uh, theory, so he actually uh, try to calculate what is the uh, um, you know the rules that governs interaction between uh, light and broadband so uh, atom and the broadband light and this broadband line is can be just you know lump that we have here so the lasers were not here so uh, last week we considered interaction by uh, taking a monochromatic light. So monochromatic light uh, provided you with the solution that uh, you know if we excite the atom with the monochromatic light we saw that uh, electron can go from a ground state to excited state but going from ground state to excited state it actually come back goes up down up down and it's this oscillation are coherent they can continue forever. This uh, rabbit flopping uh, as the exact solution of the Hamiltonian uh, in this, you know, perturbative uh, regime of a weak excitation. <coughs> but this is an exact uh, solution, and this exact solution means that we are actually going up and down, up and down, up and down. So this, this is nice. This is this is very interesting uh, result. But those of you who hear it uh, or hear now. Uh, um, the, uh, this course of uh, lasers. So, in course of lasers, y you you see that th this does not. So, what I tell you does not meet with what you get from the course in lasers. So, in course in lasers, you you have this more or less energy levels of an atom. So, for granted, uh, I, I told you where it comes from, but. Uh, you get these energy levels, and now you isolate these energy levels, and then you say that the only thing that is interesting in this situation is just to consider some uh, population of these energy levels, and then you go from the population of energy levels, um, you, you arrive to a certain uh, uh, um, the, 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 to certain uh, sweep uh, situation. The, uh, imbalance uh, population where you have uh, uh, the population of the excited state uh, e larger than the population of the ground state and then you have all this uh, um, model of uh, amplification of, uh, of a certain spontaneous emission. Now this is very different from from the model that we considered uh, last week so there is no there is no uh, coherent oscillations everything is incoherent actually in this uh, situation so apart from uh, uh, apart from a, a, a amplification, the amplification is clear, and then it, it brings you a, a light of laser. So the point is that um, you don't have you don't have this uh, nice rabbi flopping oscillation between the ground state and the excited state. You have instead uh, rate equations, and these rate equations describe you the behavior of the population uh, of the atom. So this is actually based on. Uh, uh, on the Einstein model, so we will briefly consider that uh, uh, just to connect uh, these two uh, worlds. It's not, so we will show only uh, briefly how it connects. If uh, uh, I dare, I will provide you with uh, some nice exercise you know, to, 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 deepen, to, un to deepen your understanding in, in connection between these two models. Um, there are subtle issues, and those of you who were uh, uh, this week uh, 
at the colloquium uh, that was presented by Michel de Vore, uh, uh, you know, you, 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 could, you could hear about some additional stuff about this model uh, in, in contemporary understanding of physics, um, where you actually, you know, really detect uh, the, uh, the excitation of, uh, of electronic uh, orbital from, uh, from the ground to the excited state. Anyway, so now it's it's just a, a, a Einstein model, uh, or what we know as the Einstein coefficients. So Einstein coefficients uh, considers uh, the model of uh, two levels, uh, but now these two levels actually. Uh, governed by the presence of broadband light. Uh, so the light is not monochromatic, but it actually covers. It comes from a uh, black body radiation. Um, but what uh, Einstein uh, suggests, uh, Einstein suggests that there are three different types of uh, ex uh, processes that, is going, that are going on in the system. One process is uh, absorption of light from the ground state to the excited state. And this is, uh, you know, by, by absorbing some uh, some energy from from uh, electromagnetic wave, we can go from ground state to the excited state, from E1 to E2. Um, this rate we can call like a rate one two. There is a similar rate that goes from two one. Because if we sit on the second level, so we can go back to the first level. That's also possible by the same uh, excitation. But an additional process here is uh, this process of uh, spontaneous decay, what we uh, shall call by uh, the coefficient A21. A so there is no um, coefficient A12. So these are, these are coefficients that are known under the names of AB Einstein coefficients. Um, so, and this coefficient actually describes the whole possible uh, processes, uh, and th these are correct. So, this, th these are all processes that you have in the system. They have absorption, you have stimulated emission, which is described by B21, and you have a spontaneous emission, which is described by the coefficient to one, A21. Um, now, the, the uh, uh, you know, everything else in this model is just based on uh, consideration of uh, uh, equilibrium. Um, so we can write uh, the rate equation uh, for both levels. Let's write uh, for the level uh, N2. So this is the N2 level and N1. In general, you can consider also the degeneracy of these levels. So this is not necessarily the single level, so it can be degenerate, but it's not important for us, so I, I dropped that uh, away. Um, so we have uh, this uh, time uh, dependence of the, uh, of the energy level N2, so this, uh, this level gets some population from uh, a level N1, right? So N1 multiply by the rate to go from 1 to 2 B. But here we have to uh, apply also, so multiply by uh, the density, um, the energy density uh, of the excitation that we have at this uh, frequency between 1 and 2. So that's rho, one two, two, rho of the omega 1, 2 is the energy density of the electromagnetic wave that we uh, that excite the system. So in addition, um, this goes, uh, so this, this, this increases the population, this part increases the population of N1, uh, sorry, N2. Um, there is also something that decreases the population of N2. This is N1, N2 multiplied by B21 multiplied by energy density of omega 1, 2. And now, uh, the last uh, thing that we have to take into account is the loss of the population due to the presence of the A21, which do not depend on the presence of uh, 
the external uh, electromagnetic field. So it's a spontaneous uh, uh, process, and as we uh, said just a few minutes ago, it does not depend on the presence of electromagnetic field. It depends only on the electromagnetic vacuum, which is always present. So therefore, it's uh, depend on only on N2 multiplied by A21. Right, so that's the uh, rate equation that describes a uh, change in time of the population of N2. So we can write down the same equation or similar equation to, N, uh, to N1. But because we have only two energy levels here in this story, so it's essentially clear that this uh, will be equal to minus uh, d and d2, right? Because we want to preserve uh, the material in the story. So the atom does not go anywhere except between these two levels. This is the same as uh, to say that, you know, n1 plus n2 is equal to n, which is the total uh, number of atoms in the story. <coughs> okay. Um, so what we want to say is now that if we um, so, of course, uh, the E2 minus E1, right, or E1 minus, so E2 minus E1 should be equal to H bar omega 1, 2, and this is the omega 1, 2, which is present here. So, in the thermal equilibrium, right, uh, when the dn1, dn2 dt is equal to 0, as well as dn1 dt is equal to 0. So this differential equation becomes algebraic equation, and we can essentially extract any interesting for us. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is the... This all, yeah. this is the energy density of the electromagnetic wave that present in the. Oh, okay. This is the electromagnetic excitation that excites the atom. So, but yeah, it's the it's. Only, the yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Now uh, we can actually extract out the you know, taking into account this um, uh, equilibrium. We can write that rho omega one two is actually can be expressed through these uh, um, parameters of the system. And this uh, parameters of the system um, will be equal to A21 divided by B21 multiplied by 1 divided by, by the ratio between B12 divided by B21 uh, minus 1. Okay, so this is uh, just the algebraic uh, expression of, uh, uh, of the connection between the uh, energy density and the, the coefficients, the uh, Einstein coefficients um, in, in the story. Um, so, um, Something is missing here, of course. So the ratio between N1 and N2. N1 divided by N2 multiplied by B12 divided by B21. Okay, so now this is uh, uh, something that we can uh, compare essentially with uh, uh, something that we know uh, regarding this uh, energy density. Um, so the energy, there is a problem? No, it's okay. Um, so this energy density that we extract from this uh, thermal equilibrium can be compared now with the energy density that we know from the black body radiation. So that was the idea of uh, Einstein. Uh, Einstein know, knew from uh, uh, Planck that the energy density is actually the Planck uh, uh, it follows the Planck uh, constant. Oh, the, sorry, the Planck law. And this Planck law is written like uh, h bar multiplied by omega to the third power divided by pi squared multiplied by c to the third power 
multiplied by 1 divided by exponent of uh, h bar omega divided by k Boltzmann t uh, minus 1. This is the Planck's law of the black body radiation, right? Planck's law of the black body radiation. Okay, so now we can consider or compare these two, uh, uh, two results and, and we can conclude what something about the, 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 this coefficient, right? So also in addition, uh, if we are sitting in a thermal equilibrium, so we can uh, 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 consider some uh, Boltzmann uh, uh, factor, right, in thermal equilibrium. If uh, this is a thermal equilibrium, equilibrium, then uh, we can say that uh, a ratio between n2 and n1, n2 divided by n divided by n1 is equal to exponent to the power of minus h bar omega divided by k omega 1 2 divided by k Boltzmann t. That's thermal equilibrium or Boltzmann uh, factor. Boltzmann law. So now we can uh, um, Take this part, right? And uh, so, but by the way, you know, considering this thermal equilibrium, um, uh, you can ask actually, why do you consider here the thermal equilibrium? Because you have the excitation of uh, electromagnetic wave, right? You do it because the excitation, you consider the excitation to be very, very weak. So the departure from the thermal equilibrium is essentially uh, negligible. That's correct for. Red, uh, for uh, black body radiation, that's uh, this is a true uh, 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 assumption. This is the correct assumption if you consider very weak uh, excitation. So now uh, we can uh, take everything together and say uh, the following. So now the ratio between a21 and b21 uh, will be equal just uh, this coefficient of uh, of the black body uh, radiation formula. So this means that we can say that A21 will be actually proportional to B21 and is equal to h bar omega to the third power divided by pi square multiplied by c to the third multiplied by B12. This is what we have from, uh, from comparing between these two uh, formula. So in addition, uh, we have to conclude that uh, this part essentially uh, comes from the Boltzmann uh, uh, law from thermal equilibrium. So therefore, we actually have to conclude that B12 is equal to B21. So this ratio should be equal to 1. Because the ratio between uh, N1 and N2 uh, gives exa exactly what we, uh, what we have in this uh, black body uh, radiation. So that's uh, something that uh, we got from this simple analysis. So now uh, let's see what we can uh, say about uh, 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 further, say about the, the, the excitation probability on the population of the excited state. Um, so <coughs> we need to uh, write actually uh, the energy density in the interval of uh, d omega. So rho of omega in the interval of omega can be uh, actually written as uh, epsilon zero. Um, so it's epsilon zero and multiplied by the E zero squared of omega uh, divided by two. So 
that's essentially uh, the, uh, how you can express the energy density through uh, the amplitude of uh, the electric field. Okay. So it's uh, um, so now we can actually uh, recall that uh, we know what is uh, the radio frequency from our analysis uh, a, a week ago. So the radio frequency is equal to the dipole element between uh, ground state and excited state squared multiplied by E0 squared divided by H bar. So here the E squared was uh, um, essentially of the monochromatic light, uh, which is uh, suits some. Well, it, it was not exactly the, uh, this uh, transition. It could be actually also be detuned from uh, the exact uh, transition between the two energy levels. So we describe that just as uh, uh, energy level. So, sorry, um, the amplitude of the uh, electric field squared multiplied by uh, matrix element squared divided by the H bar. That was the definition of the rabbit frequency that we made a, a week ago. Um, so now uh, we can actually uh, uh, see from here that uh, this rabbit frequency can be actually uh, expressed through uh, the energy density. Um, so in this uh, expression from the energy density can be easily obtained. Um, so this is matrix elements GE squared divided by H bar squared multiplied by 2 rho of the omega divided by epsilon 0 d omega. So now um, another uh, result that we've got um, uh, last week was to see what is the excited state population as a function of uh, time squared in uh, uh, in, the, in the perturbative uh, regime. Uh, we are talking here about very weak population of the excited state. So we are putting very uh, little amount of uh, probability to have to, to be on the excited state. Um, it, it, this was essentially equal to radio frequency squared multiplied by sine squared delta t divided by 2 divided by delta squared where I remind you that the delta is essentially the omega 0 minus omega. So it's omega 0 is 1, 2, right? So here in our story, it's the difference between uh, the energy level of 1, 2 and omega is essentially the frequency of the light. So in this particular case, this was the monochromatic light, but here we have a distribution according to Planck's law. <coughs> So this omega can be different. So this is uh, delta changes as a function of uh, omega. So that, that was the solution. That was the result of uh, our calculation last time. Um, so now we can actually uh, uh, sub, uh, substitute uh, this uh, radio frequency. Um, and um, so and I, I have to say that there is something missing here. So in this formulas, this should be squared, and this should be squared. So if it's not square here, so this should be d e divided by h bar. Um, so this is squared squared. OK, everything is OK now. Um, now is uh, uh, we can substitute this radio frequency squared with this uh, formula. And uh, we can say that actually CE, or the, uh, um, the probability to find the atom on the excited state, CE of T squared, should be equal to uh, this prefactor of 2DGE squared divided by uh, epsilon 0 h bar squared. Now the integral goes from omega 0 minus uh, delta over 2 to omega 0. Well, you know, I uh, shouldn't keep here omega 0, but omega 1, 2 plus delta over 2. 
and rho of omega multiplied by sine sinus of sinus square of delta t divided by 2 divided by delta squared the omega that what we what we should do in order to uh, present so here the uh, so we, we take the integral, so we essentially we have to take the integral between the infini plus infinity to minus infinity, of course. But we can actually realize that um, this sync function is, so th this can be represented as a sync function, and this sync function is really narrow as compared to the broadband light. So this broadband light is very, very broad. And we actually going to consider the situation where this delta is essentially goes to zero. Um, which means that everything which is very far away from the resonance will play no role in this uh, excitation. Um, okay, so now um, we, we are uh, adding here um, t, t square, right? So in this story, um, so t divided by 2 uh, squared. So now if we add here also uh, the t over 2 and here t over 2, then we are OK. So we can make a, um, right, so yeah, first it, it should be added the omega minus omega 1 minus omega 1, 2 minus omega 0 in order to get the delta, right? And then it's multiplied by t, so that's t over 2, then change of the variable, so that's delta, and then you can perform this uh, integral. So essentially, it will give you uh, the CE of t squared will be equal to this 2d g e squared divided by epsilon 0 h squared. Um, so now what we do is, um, so we essentially consider this density, uh, energy density, to be constant over the very narrow, uh, very narrow transition between this and energy level and the second, and uh, between 1 and 2, between these two energy levels. So rho of omega has this shape, right? So this this type of the shape, which is uh, the uh, shape uh, which is not uniform, of course. But because we have something very narrow as compared to uh, this very broad uh, transition, we can essentially uh, assume that this can be considered like like a rho of omega 1, 2 only. So we take this value at the resonance and say that everything else around the resonance will be just the same value. So it's a good approximation because the rate of the black body radiation, the change of uh, this uh, spectrum density, uh, this uh, energy density of the black body radiation over the very narrow transition between the uh, two energy levels is not very significant. Is, uh, and then we can uh, have here just uh, the integral between minus phi to phi uh, of the function of sinc squared uh, x dx. Not changing the. Uh, so this function, um, so this integral is actually uh, analytical integral if you have uh, phi uh, goes to infinity. So from minus infinity to plus infinity, this integral will be equal to pi. If you go to infinity, this integral will be equal to phi, pi, right? So you can uh, argue that this is not allowed because I am just I'm not allowed to do that. Um, but I can argue back that this is perfectly OK. So because uh, essentially, this integral, uh, 
concentrate the, 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 the very narrow value, right? So sync function decreases very much, and so all these waves that you have uh, uh, that goes away from the center contribute very little to this integral. So I put here about, so this is approximate solution. So this approximate solution will be perfectly well if I take here just uh, an exact value of this integral. Um, now, therefore, we actually get the, uh, um, the solution uh, to, uh, to our um, uh, population. So this population uh, will be equal to 2d ge squared divided by epsilon 0 h bar squared multiplied by the uh, value of this energy uh, density at uh, resonance multiplied by pi uh, t divided by 2. So that's essentially the result. And now we can say that um, B wants you in our story. Uh, is uh, so the rate, the excitation rate, right? So here, for example, the excitation rate is equal to uh, B12 multiplied by the energy density. So this means that uh, uh, rates, uh, so, and this is exactly what is written here. So this is an excitation rate. So we can say that B12 will be equal to C excited as a function of T squared divided by time. Um, so that's the rate. Uh, and this uh, rate of the excitation is equal to uh, uh, the excited level population uh, divided by time. Um, so and uh, we can say that um, um, uh, excuse me, no, the correct thing is just to write that this is the excitation rate. So the excitation rate is equal to B12 rho of omega, right? Multiply of rho of omega, so this is the uh, excitation rate, 1, 2, and this excitation rate is equal to population of the excited state divided by, by time. So now we can actually uh, see from here that uh, we can uh, uh, get uh, the, the, the value of uh, the Einstein coefficient, which is, uh, the Einstein coefficient, which is B12. But um, before we do that, there is something missing here. So the prefactor, there is a prefactor which is equal to one third. So it comes from nowhere. So it's not from nowhere. So this one third comes from the fact that we consider uh, arbitrary polarization of light. So this uh, light uh, is just uh, the black body uh, radiation. So black body radiation has arbitrary polarization. So this arbitrary polarization is actually should be counted for and gives uh, the factor of one third here. So now from here, we can say that B12 is just equal to um, pi uh, divided by d, uh, multiplied by dge squared divided by three times epsilon zero h bar squared. So that's essentially the value of uh, B12. Um, it has, apart from several uh, constants of nature, uh, this uh, matrix element, uh, which is the matrix element between the state one and two. Um, and this matrix element um, is, is an important, of course, uh, central gradient in order to understand what is the rate of excitation of this story. So, uh, but now from here, we can uh, get uh, 
uh, essentially uh, the value of, uh, of this uh, spontaneous emission because the value of the spontaneous emission rate uh, is just uh, multiply, multiplying this value by, by uh, this prefactor and we get uh, a, uh, excitations uh, of, uh, of the system. So you see that um, from here, uh, you don't have any oscillations of the population between the two energy levels. So this, uh, th this excitation doesn't exist. So this type of uh, modulation of the population between, uh, uh, between two levels doesn't exist. So this is, of course, also because we are actually considering the excitation of the very weak excitation. Uh, so very weak excitation. Uh, uh, gives that the population of the excited state is very small. So this means that, uh, you know, in, in our uh, previous uh, treatment, uh, this was also sort of the modulations, very small modulation or very small oscillations of, of the excited level above uh, zero. But uh, it's also uh, important to understand that this uh, integration actually over broadband light, so will actually smear out any coherent information about any oscillations that you have. So if you remember that this uh, Rabi flopping depend on the tuning. So what is the oscillation frequency of uh, the population between the ground state and the side state depend on the tuning. So depend on this parameter, on the parameter how far you are from the resonance. So if you are exactly at the resonance, you have the oscillations at the frequency uh, of uh, so the, the, the oscillation frequency is equal to the uh, square root of uh, Rabi uh, squared plus delta squared. This is the effective effective Rabi frequency, and this oscillation uh, uh, means that uh, it's slow relatively if the delta is equal to zero. So if delta is not equal to zero, so this oscillation becomes very uh, fast. So this is something that we described uh, a week ago. So now if you take all these oscillations, now you have a broadband light. So this broadband light uh, uh, has frequencies uh, all over uh, the relevant area around, uh, around this uh, frequency. So every single frequency will contribute, right? So and this, all these oscillations should be actually averaged uh, through the integration, so and all uh, all of them are different frequencies. So uh, once you average them over the uh, different frequencies, you smear out all all oscillations. So broadband light do not continue any continue, continue do not uh, get into account any information about uh, these uh, oscillations. But this is not the only uh, the only uh, reason you don't see any uh, oscillations here, and actually not the main one. So the main one is this coefficient, essentially, the spontaneous emission. So the spontaneous emission uh, is the main killing factor of uh, the coherence that exists in, uh, in the system uh, that we considered last week. So last week, we didn't consider any type of, co of spontaneous emission. We didn't have it okay, in our model, in our Hamiltonian. It, it was just not there. So here, it's plugged in. Uh, uh, Phenomenologically, actually, this model is, the, the whole model is phenomenological, so you plugged in everything more or less, but in correct manner. So you get some, some correct estimations of this uh, ex excitation coefficients. That this, is, this is true. Uh, you get the correct values, but um, you, you miss quite a lot about this uh, model, especially uh, what is connected to uh, uh, to coherent uh, oscillation. So this is not the correct way to do. This is just uh, to connect uh, the world between the rate equation, the world of rate equation, uh, and the world of uh, uh, this equivalent treatment of uh, monochromatic light. And uh, uh, here, from here on, I'm just uh, leaving this model uh, w without continuing it. So it's it's not it's not that uh, interesting for us. Um, but I just wanted to show that this is uh, absolutely essential uh, to have this type of uh, uh, decay in order to get some idea of thermal equilibrium. But once you have thermal equilibrium, this means that the rate of excitation is equal to rate of decay, and this decay might be more significant than this one. 
Um, and therefore, no uh, coherence is left and no oscillations left. So you can actually talk about this very type of the weight equation to discuss only population of energy levels. This is not what uh, is interesting. So we want to take the full treatment uh, that will take into account also this type of decay, so the uh, spontaneous emission in the phenomenological uh, way. But, we, uh, but until that, in order to get there, so we first of all need to introduce uh, the phenomenology of, uh, of the density matrix because this is uh, the essential part uh, of all the story. So I'm leaving this model. So we get uh, some ideas. Um, and I'm getting back to optical block equations, or so actually I'm going to develop the optical block equations in order to uh, describe the interaction between the two and the two uh, uh, level uh, system with uh, 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 with light, monochromatic light. So we are getting getting back to the monochromatic light, and uh, we, are, we are getting to uh, to describe the situation. But now. Instead of so, before we are doing that, I, I want to make uh, uh, some some statements about the density matrix formalism. So some of you uh, some of you know what density matrix is. Uh, some of you probably not. So because uh, this is uh, also those of you who are at the, at the third year of the. Uh, the first degree uh, usually do not know what the systematic uh, formalism means. Um, so the idea is that um, uh, so uh, we, we describe the system in the, in the pure state. So usually, right? So usually, we can say that the system is uh, states in a certain in a certain state. And this state can be just uh, uh, described as a pure state. Um, so in case of our discussion where we have two energy levels, one and two, and the uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation that excite them, so we can say in general that our system sits in some quantum superposition, in some uh, superposition state between the uh, up and down state. So I will write down this uh, wave function, uh, which should be normalized, 1 over square root of 2 multiplied by being uh, plus and being minus. So I'm coming back to some language that you probably already forgot, uh, but I would like to remind you. Um, that we saw uh, this type of uh, this type of uh, reasoning when we discussed the Sternger experiment. So Sternger experiment back to a uh, couple of months ago, right? So in the very beginning, so we discussed the uh, Sternger experiment. So this is essentially a very uh, nice and suitable system in order to introduce uh, uh, the density matrix formalism in the story. So it's, it's uh, here, you know, it's, it's similar to two body, to two level system. So I have a spin up, spin down. So it's like a two level system. So being in a, a state uh, G and being on a state E. So it seems to be that uh, writing this pure state will describe any situation that is uh, available in the in nature, right? So you can have uh, some. Uh, arbitrary phase between uh, being in the plus or my being in the minus state. So you have some arbitrary state phase. And this means that you, uh, you are essentially done. So you, you describe your system in full uh, manner. So the, the claim is that is not really correct. So this, is, this will not explain uh, the experimental observation. So and if you remember, this uh, apparatus, right, the Stern-Gerlach apparatus was the gradient of the magnetic field. So the gradient of the magnetic field and then the beam of atom that goes through this gradient, which is split in two points. So spin uh, one half up, spin uh, one half down. 
So these two spots were the results of uh, the presence of the spin that can be up or down of the electronic orbital. So now, um, now the question is, if I take this apparatus you know, along, that was the z direction and the x, y direction, so and I, I've got the split of this uh, uh, of the results into two spots. So now the question: If you rotate your apparatus somehow, at a, diff at a different angle, will you observe these two spots or not? Right. So we talked a little bit about that uh, that time. Um, so the question is, uh, experimentally, right, you will always see these two spots. So whatever the angle of rotation of your apparatus is, right? So whatever you take the rotation um, about the, uh, the, pr the axis of z, x, y, so whatever the rotation you take, you actually always expect to see these two spots, right? So this is something intuitive, and this is indeed the, the correct result. So the claim is that this description of your state of atoms will not uh, be correct to describe this result, this simple, uh, simple result. So in order to, dis to, to, to show that, so let's uh, consider that we rotate uh, our apparatus at a certain angle. Um, and this uh, certain angle uh, will be actually uh, angle phi. Or, so we rotate our apparatus in the direction of u. This is the unit vector, u, which is equal to cosine phi multiplied by ux. This is the unitary vector in the x direction, plus sine phi and multiplied by unitary uh, vector in y direction. So let's suppose that we do this type of the rotation, okay? So now, if we get this type of the rotation, um, uh, what we will get, right? So um, what we will get uh, will be the following. So the uh, um, operator, or our observable, um, will be equal to mu phi, which is equal to mu x, right? Uh, multiplied by sine phi plus uh, mu y multiplied by cosine phi. Once, uh, so I'm just uh, uh, reminding you that uh, mu x, mu y, mu z, there are essentially uh, the Pauli matrices multiplied by b mu zero. So, um, in order to describe the correct uh, uh, correct experiments, so right, so mu x is just the mu zero of one zero zero. Uh, mu x is sorry, it's off diagonal. It's zero one one zero. Mu y is mu zero is 0, 0, i, mi uh, i minus y, i. And mu z, that was the uh, a result uh, multiplied by 1 minus 1, 0, 0. So if I rotate now, so that, that's the observable that I will see. Uh, which is the multiplication of mu x sinus phi plus mu y cosinus phi. So I can describe this actually like mu zero multiplied by the um, uh, the matrix of zero e to the power i f minus i phi, and here I have e to the power i phi, and here I have a zero. Um, so th th this will be essentially the observable that uh, that I measure. Um, so now we can actually show quite easily that this observable is the eigen. Uh, uh, so the, the uh, state of uh, of uh, th this vector, this pure state, 
is the eigenstate of this operator. Okay, so if you just take this state uh, and write it as, uh, you know, up to the factor of uh, 1 over square root of 2 is uh, a 1 and e to the power i phi, right, that's our state. So if you take this state and you uh, apply an operator, which is the observable, right, our observable that, uh, that we see in the experiment, if you apply this operator to this state, you will get this state back. So this means that this state is the eigenstate of this operator. Which means that if I am uh, rotating my apparatus on this specific angle, right, in this specific direction, which is the cosine phi as compared to uh, direction of ux and sine phi at a certain phi angle in the xy plane, if I rotated the operator in x, so the, op the apparatus in xy plane by angle of phi, then I will be able to uh, observe a single spot, right? So, which is not correct. So, which means that, you know, in all this uh, story of uh, directing the, uh, the op apparatus on a certain angle, I can rotate it at a certain angle, and at this single angle, instead of seeing two spots, I will see one spot. And this is not something that you actually expect. So, you do expect uh, to see two spots in any direction of the rotation. So, this means that pure state, whatever the pure state is, will not describe correctly the situation. So, we really need to make a different uh, language. So, in this la different language is indeed density matrix uh, formalism. So, we need to introduce the density matrix in order to describe, uh, uh, describe the state. Oh, yeah, we'll describe correctly uh, the situation. Okay, so... Um, so the density matrix, right, that we are uh, describing... Um, so, I, I'm going to uh, use the second... Probably it's, it's important to uh, note here that this is, of course, related to uh, Stern Gerlach. Stern Gerlach experiment. Okay? Okay, so now this is not relevant anymore. Okay, so we are uh, talking about the density matrix uh, formalism. We know that the, um, uh, the pure state, so the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, or whatever the Hamiltonian is, right? So by uh, applying the, the pure, pure state from both states, from both sides, so this is the expectation value, uh, we can write this as a, as a sum of n m h n m uh, c n and c m so and there's a combination right so the combination of these uh, elements will be essentially the part of the density matrix so if n is equal to m then i will have the c n squared or c m squared this is the populations, but the combination 
between these uh, two, the Cn multiplied by Cm square, uh, complex conjugate, this is what we call clearances. Right, so this is essentially uh, the part uh, that is not, cannot be very well known. Um, essentially here, you know, the uh, failure of the pure state is in the fact that we know exactly the phase difference of phase uh, relation between the coefficient C1 and the coefficient of C2. So in the language of quantum mechanics means that uh, the pure state has the maximal knowledge of, uh, of uh, the quantum state uh, allowed by quantum mechanics. <coughs> but if you don't know, by some reason, we don't know what is the ratio between these two phases, so this is exactly what we described by the multiplication of these two factors. And this uh, multiplication will give uh, you know, if, if it goes to zero, this means that you don't have a coherence in the state. So you know only the populations. So if, if you know only the populations, only the C squared, C1 squared here, C2 squared here, so if I'm just uh, writing down the, uh, uh, you know, the psi is the sum over n, Cn of t, psi n, so I just developed this uh, psi uh, uh, function on uh, the basis of psi n. So I, if I know only c n squared, right? So then this will be knowledge about the populations, and this is exactly what uh, is the, the uh, what what we operate when we uh, make uh, operation of uh, uh, rate equations. So we operate with populations, not with the coherences. So the coherence will be the ratio between two, two phases of these two elements. So if we know the phases very well, then, uh, then uh, we know uh, uh, then uh, we know this, that the system will be in the pure state. If you don't know, then this, this uh, system should be described by uh, by certain uh, density matrix, so that's uh, essentially the, dis the definition of the density matrix. Psi, so, yeah, sigma is equal to sigma n m equal to c n c m uh, complex conjugate. So, and this uh, density matrix, in case of two level system, this is just uh, a simple two by two matrix. If we have only state A or sta state B, so this is a two-level system, then we get uh, uh, the density matrix sigma to be sigma BB, sigma AA, sigma AB, sigma BA. That's the density matrix that will describe this uh, system uh, fully. Uh, where, of course, uh, sigma BB, according to this uh, definition, what sigma BB means, sigma BB means sigma uh, CB squared, <coughs> sigma AA will be CA squared, that's the populations, <coughs> and sigma AB uh, will be the CACB, and sigma BA will be C B C A complex conjugate. That's our parameters that will be uh, more suitable to describe the situation because in this situation I could actually say that all I know, for example, in this uh, formalism of Stengelhoff experiment, the, all I know about this uh, experiment is the population of uh, spin up and spin down, and not uh, the ratio between th this phase. And therefore, this coherence is actually is, if I'm averaging over many different realizations, then these coherences are equal to zero. So this will be equal to zero, this will be equal to zero. Only populations are not zero. And then whatever the rotation that I take will not give me zero result, okay? 
will always give me two spots if I describe the system by matrix, uh, by, density, by density matrix. So I mean, this is uh, actually an additional information that we have to take into account. So what, how, how coherences behave as compared to populations. Oh, if you want, so that that's that's a question of uh, convenience. This is really a question of convenience. So, how what is the hierarchy of your energy levels, right? So, you want to put here sigma A A, and here sigma B B. Fine, no problem. Um, the basis will be the same in this situation. So, you know, it's still uh, the levels A and B. Um, this is really just the question of where the zero of energy you want to put. Um, that's, you know, that's the whole story. I mean, if, if you want to be, uh, you know, not, nothing is wrong if you just want to put uh, sigma A here and sigma DB here. You know, it's not. But you, you have to take your uh, vectors here in the correct uh, in the correct manner, right? So in the correct uh, correction, in the correct uh, way. Um, okay. So now. Um, now, in order to uh, solve, now, now uh, this is the matrix, right? Not the state. So the state uh, was in order to find how the state develops as a function of time or develops as a function of uh, whatever it is to find the ground state. Um, you should uh, you should go and solve Schrodinger equation. So here you cannot solve Schrodinger equation for density matrix. So you have to uh, solve uh, Schrodinger equation for density matrix. <laughs> So it's not called Schrodinger equation, it's called uh, von Neumann equation, but this is essentially uh, the, uh, the Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation for density matrix. So this means that the equation of motion of the density matrix will be equal to, uh, so d dt sigma will be equal to uh, a commutation relation between the Hamiltonian and the density matrix. Um, so that's the von Neumann equation that describes the uh, time uh, uh, development of the density matrix. Um, that's essentially all the story, right? Yeah. So this, then we have to uh, write down this uh, equation and solve this, uh, this problem. Um, but it's... Um, write that this is the von Neumann equation. So the, the thing that is, that does not present, so what is this Hamiltonian, right? So what is this Hamiltonian? So we are still, if we are going to use the well-known Hamiltonian from our point of view, so what is the Hamiltonian here? Hamiltonian H0, which describes this two-level system, 1, 2. And in addition, I have a interaction, Hamiltonian of energy, so the electric dipole interaction between a, a monochromatic light and, uh, and the two-level system. But if I consider only this, so I miss what, what was present here in the model of a Einstein equation. So I will miss the spontaneous submission. So it does not present here in this Hamiltonian, as we discussed in the beginning of this, uh, of this hour. So, yeah, there are two possibilities. One possibility is to add here this Hamiltonian, which is the electric dipole interaction between atom and electromagnetic vacuum, which we are not going to do. Or additional, uh, the additional, another possibility is just to add phenomenologically, as we said, here the decay uh, coefficient, so d sigma dt, uh, and this will be the decay that we plug in, not very, uh, 
you know, sophisticated, in a, not in a, in a very sophisticated way. We just plug in by hand. Okay. So that's the uh, equation of motion that we want to uh, describe. And now I think that uh, I will have a break for a quarter of hours before we will do uh, uh, this uh, uh, calculations, right? So in order to get what so-called uh, the uh, optical block equation. So I hope we we want to make the, uh, this uh, equation done. And and I will show different approximations that are important on the way. Okay. Um, so, here, this is not part of the story. Okay, essentially we need to write uh, this equation, right? Open it and uh, see what we get. So, now, that's the story that is essentially called the optical block equations. That's the story of, uh, of the qubit. Uh, so, if you want to understand the language of uh, um, more than quantum computers, you should know that, sort of, as a basis. Um, we have, uh, uh, so if we take this and take this Hamiltonian, right, and this Hamiltonian is just uh, the uh, h bar omega zero of uh, the excited state, dB, so here we have the excitation level. Uh, so this is the uh, electric dipole uh, Hamiltonian as we wrote it for the electric field, which is the cosine function of, uh, of, the, of time uh, phase only. So and then uh, we can uh, write down uh, four equations for each, uh, each um, density matrix element. So for sigma BB, uh, we have I omega rabi uh, multiplied by cosine omega LT multiplied by the difference between the sigma BA minus sigma AB. Double B is the first equation, the second equation will be for the population AA. And here we have minus I omega R multiplied by cosine omega L T multiplied by sigma BA minus sigma AB. The third equation will be the equation for the coherences AB. This one will be I omega zero multiplied by sigma AB minus I omega rabi cosine omega LT difference between sigma BB minus sigma AA and then sigma BA has the uh, minus I omega zero sigma BA plus I omega R cosine omega laser T multiplied by sigma BB minus sigma AA. Okay, so these are essentially four equations, which is a result of opening this uh, commutation relation between Hamiltonian and uh, density matrix. 
And from this side, we have uh, the density matrix uh, um, uh, as a function of time. Um, so the derivative of the uh, different uh, elements of the density matrix. So they, 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 these are four uh, coupled equations. Uh, um, four uh, coupled equations for different uh, dens elements of uh, density matrix. Okay, now, um, so everything is, so Rabi frequency is just the uh, matrix element multiplied by the, uh, uh, the intensity of the, uh, the uh, maximal of the field, of the electric field of the uh, laser or in the mo monochromatic light. So it's, it's here, the, the, the matrix element. And here we have uh, this laser in the story. And here we have the omega zero. Omega zero is the uh, frequency difference between the ground state and the excited state. So we have four coupled equations, which are um, sort of, you know, that, that we need to uh, bring to some, some type of a uh, solution. So in order to solve them, um, we can, uh, represent the cosine as the usual uh, representation in the uh, phases of the one half of uh, e to the power of i omega laser t plus e to the power of minus i omega laser t. Uh, and so this we can plug in this story right and get so if I'm continuing, for example, this equation, so I'll get I omega rabi multiplied by one half of uh, the e to the power of I omega laser t plus e to the power of minus omega laser t. That's uh, uh, the cosine, which is multiplied by the sigma b a minus sigma a b. So if I multiply this, two uh, parentheses, I get four terms, right? So one half I omega rabi. So now I have the term was, uh, which is the um, sigma B A E to the power of I omega laser T. That's the first one. The second one plus sigma B A E to the power minus omega laser T. So now we have two other terms, minus sigma a, b, e to the power of i omega laser t, minus sigma a, b, e to the power of minus i omega laser t. So there are four terms here. They are not of the same, uh, uh, they do not have the same contribution in the story. Uh, part of them are really, so part of, of those terms has a very fast phase and part has very slow phase. So this can be seen from here, from these two equations. So, take, so let's suppose that Rabi frequency is going to zero, so sort of, you know, goes down to zero. Now this part is sort of very small or zero. Then I have this, uh, part of the equation where this sigma a b is uh, essentially develops with the frequency omega zero. So the solution of this equation will be e to the power of i omega zero t, right? So this is sigma a b. So if I'm taking this sigma a b, right, it, it has uh, uh, the evolution of uh, omega zero uh, t. So, and then if I'm taking this, for example, part, uh, it has uh, the uh, evolution of, uh, of the phase uh, uh, that goes like omega zero plus omega laser. So, which is very fast. If uh, we take uh, uh, the condition that omega zero is about omega laser, so we have near zero resonance uh, conditions. So here, this will be proportional to the e to the power of i omega laser plus omega zero, t, right? Uh, but if we are say, if we are looking at here, right? So here, this term will be proportional to the e to the power of i omega minus omega zero, 
Uh, wait a second. I'm uh, uh, here. A B, sorry, I A B. Yes, it's plus I omega zero. So it's I omega zero minus omega L T. So you see that these two guys has very different phases. So this one has a very fast phase, and this has a very slow phase. So this is essentially uh, uh, what rotating wave approximation uh, says us. So it says that these fast phases we can neglect, we can throw away, right? So it also can be understood in the language of uh, second quantization that this is actually counter-rotating terms that take the atom from A to B, right? Taking the A from A to B, you need to absorb the photon, that this term uh, will give you the a destructive uh, operator, so a constructive operator. So you create the photon. So you take the atom from ground state to excited state and you create the photon. So it's an anti rotating term. Um, it's in the language of second quantization that I'm not using here, so that, therefore <laughs> you, you don't need to, uh, to compare that, but it can be understood from here. So this is the part that we can actually drop. It's not interesting, and the same part of the phase, uh, fast phase can be found here, so it's here, right? So it goes to zero because we also have BA here that will be proportional to minus I omega zero, so minus and minus will give you the same fast phase. So this neglecting those terms is the meaning of the rotating wave approximation. So this rotating wave approximation known very well known in the, in the field, rotating wave approximation we will see this rotating wave approximation a little bit later um, I will give you the geometrical interpretation of uh, optical Bloch equations and I will return back to these, uh, those approximations you will see them by eyes the meaning of these terms Okay, in a geometrical way. So, but now I can uh, just say that, uh, you know, we can uh, make this uh, rotating wave approximation and then making the rotating wave approximation, these four equations will reduce to, to, uh, to uh, equations with, uh, which we can write as following. Sigma B, B uh, with time. Um, will go like uh, um, I omega rabi one half of sigma B A that we have here with the positive exponent omega L T minus sigma A B e to the power minus I omega laser T. This is only two terms that we keep in the rotating wave approximation. So here we make rotating wave approximation. Um, so in the second equation, if we do the same, we will have sigma a a uh, as a function of time goes like a minus i omega rabi multiplied by one half. And this is here is sigma b a e to the power i omega laser t minus sigma a b e to the power minus i omega l t. That's it. So from these two equations, there are only two terms to raise. Um, the same way we get uh, in uh, the following two equations for a, b. Uh, as, so its derivative in time will be equal to i omega zero sigma a, b minus i omega rabi one half of e to the power of i omega laser t multiplied by sigma b b minus sigma a a. And for sigma b a uh, derivative on time, we will have the minus i omega zero sigma b a plus i omega rabi 
one half of e to the power of minus i omega l t sigma b b minus sigma a a. Okay, so these are four equations now that we have after we made the, 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 what we call as rotating wave approximation. Okay, now, uh, now we need to solve these equations. So in solving this equation, there will be a very nice trick to do. So these are still, you know, messy uh, equations. Uh, we can remove some, we can make another nice uh, thing here. We can go into rotating frame. So here, this is the step that is called rotating wave approximation. Now the next step is to go to rotating frame and to make uh, exchange of variables. So we make the variables exchange. <coughs> I will yeah, go up. So the variables exchange of variables. we call new new variables and these new variables um, will be uh, the rotating new new variables we will call them uh, like uh, sigma tilde of B A, B, uh, sigma tilde B A will be equal to sigma B A multiplied by E to the power of I omega laser T. Uh, sigma A B will be equal to tilde, will be equal to A sigma A B multiplied to E to the power of minus I omega laser T. Right, so this is to, with the fast rotating. Uh, um, the new one will be the old one multiplied by the fast rotation, right? Um, in phase. So, and the tilde of A A actually do not change, and sigma B B do not change either. So tilde of sigma A and sigma B B are equal to the same. So this is called to go from a reference frame to the rotating frame. So new variables going to the rotating frame. Okay, going from the to the rotating frame, we now can uh, make this variable change of variables and write this equation uh, again. So, what is nice in this situation that you you magically remove the time dependence from the equations. So, you get uh, these four uh, equations in the following way. So, sigma b b tilde as a function of that. So, derivative of the b b. Um, will be equal to i one half of sigma r multiplied by sigma b b sigma b a tilde minus sigma a b tilde. Right? You see that because we essentially get this one um, and exchange it by a single variable. So here, this one will be the sigma b a tilde. So the explicit dependence on time somehow disappears here, right? Um, so we make the same uh, trick for sigma AA. Uh, what, sorry, yeah, right. Um, yeah, yeah, right, okay. So sigma AA uh, derivative on time will be equal to minus i one half of Rabi frequency multiplied by sigma b a minus sigma a b. Okay, 
Okay, now, uh, derivative in time of tilde sigma a, b equal to minus i delta sigma a, b minus i one half of Rabi frequency of sigma b, b minus sigma a, a. Um, So delta, of course, here comes uh, from the difference between the omega zero, which is here, right? This is here, and uh, the omega that comes from, and then we have the omega through the uh, derivative, right, uh, um, of sigma a b. Here we have a derivative of sigma a b tilde. So, and we have to make the derivative of this guy, so the derivative of this guy will give uh, the term with omega laser down, and this will be uh, transferred to the second part, and here instead of uh, omega uh, zero, we will have uh, the difference between omega zero and the omega laser, so this is why the delta comes into the story here. Right? So, now the last one will be sigma b a derivative in time will be equal to i delta sigma b a plus i one half Rabi frequency sigma b b minus sigma a a. Nice, right? So we have now four different equations uh, and somehow all phases or disappears from here. Um, we only have slow motion, no explicit time dependence, and something which do not rotate with uh, fast frequencies. No laser frequency, no uh, atomic frequency, only the difference between them. And this is due to the fact that we are going into rotating frame. We actually rotate equivalences uh, with as fast as the uh, oscillation frequency of the laser. Okay, so again, I will present a little bit later uh, a geometrical interpretation of, uh, of, of these uh, transformations. You will see what is the meaning of them. Okay, so now this is not the last one to, to make. So now let's make the last uh, movement. So the last movement will be another uh, variable change. So we introduce new variables. W will be equal to one half of sigma BB tilde minus sigma AA tilde. A U variable of U, we will have one half sigma AB tilde plus sigma b a tilde and v will be equal to 1 over 2 i sigma a b tilde minus sigma b a tilde. So these are new variables and we need only three um, because it's, it's actually, you know, they are redundant, these uh, four uh, variables. Sigma A, A, sigma B, B, sigma A, B, sigma B, A, they are not totally independent. So we actually need only three variables, you know, three uh, variables in order to solve this uh, question because, you know, it's, it's just the same uh, conservation of uh, material, so we have to find atom somewhere, so sigma BB plus sigma AA should be equal to one, and that means that uh, we can essentially uh, have only three vari independent variables, in, and the first one is dependent. So this factor of one half is not always present, so you can make different, so you will get the same result if you do not introduce here one half. <coughs> the, this, these equations, sometimes it's, in, it's convenient to introduce here one half, sometimes not. So let me keep it one half right now 
uh, with us that essentially the final equation, which and um, so the final set of equations. So making this uh, substitution, we get W. Um, derivative of time as the equation as, as a W, so which is the difference between these two uh, um, uh, populations, will be equal to Rabi frequency multiplied by uh, V. And that's it. And then uh, we get the U time equal to delta multiplied by V. And then v dot t will be equal to minus delta u minus omega rabi. Uh, so don't forget that what I'm doing now still has no uh, decay terms. So all these, uh, the, all the, those equations do not include the part, phenomenological part of the decay. So here everything is essentially very, uh, uh, still has the Hamiltonian, which has no spontaneous emission in the part. So these are three equations that we end up with. This, the same equation you will get if you remove this one half out of the story. So one half is not, is not necessarily uh, uh, needed, so it will be needed once we will uh, consider a uh, steady state solution of this uh, uh, of these equations. Uh, they are actually halting if you are if you try not to uh, to see this uh, spontaneous decay. So um, just pay attention. You, you can do, you, you get the same equation if you if you don't have this factor of one half present. Okay, so these are equations, and this is essentially the optical block equations for three different uh, variables, omega u and v. Okay, so omega, if you, especially if you forgot about the factor of uh, one half, you get here um, the difference between the population in the excited state and the population in the ground state. So if you are in the ground state, be uh, in the ground state you are essentially equal to, so without the factor of one half, you are minus one, right, on these, on the, uh, this u, v, and w plane, right, so this sort of the coordinate uh, system of uh, three coordinates, so we have u, v, with w, so now um, this w means just the population difference. So if you are uh, sitting in the ground state on the AA, so you, you, are, minus, you are equal to minus one. Uh, forget about the one half. Uh, and now if you are sitting on the excited state, you, are, you're, you will have plus one. So that's essentially the meaning of the W. So U and V has the coherences inside. So they are sort of related to some so they are related to coherences. So we need to understand uh, so the meaning of these uh, new variables, right? So essentially, I want to. Uh, uh, so the meaning of the uh, variable W is is clear. So that's just uh, the difference between the population of two levels. Now, what is the uh, meaning of the difference U and V uh, of the uh, variables U and V? Um, okay. So, in order to do that, uh, we can uh, essentially make uh, uh, the following. Um, let me remove that. So, the meaning, meaning of u and v. What are they? So in order to do that, let's uh, calculate the expectation value of the dipole operator. We want to, uh, to calculate the expectation value of the dipole operator. So this expectation value, if we are talking now about not the state, but the density matrix, will be the trace over the uh, multiplication of the density matrix sigma 
and the, op the, the, the operator, the expectation value uh, of the uh, dipole operator. So now this means that we actually have this operator A, B, uh, which is multiplied by a, um, so the, this operator is of diagonal, right? So it has zero on the diagonal and it's uh, some value of diagonal values. So therefore, here we'll have the sum of the off diagonal elements, sigma of the density matrix, sigma AB plus sigma BA. So it's only related to uh, uh, coherences of the density matrix. Now, if we are getting back, right? Um, So in order to understand how to, so that, that's our, our original values, right? Sigma A, B, Sigma A, B, Sigma B, A, Sigma A, B. So now we need to go through all this decomposition back uh, through to, to three different steps of uh, changing the variables, right? Uh, actually two times we change the variable, first uh, First time we change the variables to tilde in the rotating frame, and then we change the variables to the w, u, and v. So redoing that, so you know, to extract back sigma. So here we need to substitute sigma a b and sigma b a, right, in the language of new variables. So in order to do that, you need to go back, sort of, to extract this through the variables u, v, w and then extract these variables back to sigma a, sigma b. Okay. So doing this algebra, uh, you will get to um, the final result. Um, so it's 2ab, 2dab, multiply by uh, u multiplied by cosine omega l t minus v multiplied by sine omega l t. If you do all this uh, arithmetic stuff, um, that will that the, the result that you will arrive. Um, so the expectation value of the density of the dipole operator is actually proportional to u and v. So u and v operator, u and v variables um, describe the expectation value of the of, of the dipole operator. And it's not only that it's uh, it, it's actually uh, in, in in phase and in quadrature with the. Uh, a, Electric field. So electric field that we uh, consider here was E of T will be was equal to E zero multiplied by cosine omega laser T. So it's a cos cosine function. So here we have a cosine function multiplies the U variable, or U multiplies the cosine uh, omega uh, laser T. So this part of the uh, of, uh, uh, of this uh, expectation value of the uh, a dipole operator is proportional to, so it's in, in phase with uh, the uh, electric field that makes this excitation. So U is in phase, this is the in phase with this uh, field, and this is in quadrature. So it has uh, this part, V, uh, reacts. So this is the answer, right? So of the, uh, uh, of the uh, atom to the excitation, right? So U and V, they are essentially two parts of the dipole moment. So dipole moment, uh, uh, so the, 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 when we excite the atom with the electric uh, electric field, so the atom actually reacts in two in two parts. There is a dipole moment that is created, but this dipole moment, this expectation value of this dipole moment, 
has the part which reacts in phase with uh, the electric field excitation. So the excitation makes uh, uh, some excitation and we have the same in, in phase reaction of the atom. But here we have some amplitude that is multiplied uh, the part which is the quad in quadrature, which with some phase delay of 90 degrees as compared to excitation. So in this in quadrature, has its amplitude. So the dipole moment that we create by applying uh, electric field on atom essentially has two different elements, one in phase and one in quadrature. This is what we get from this result, right? Um, and these two elements has different meanings, actually. So it's essentially uh, now writing this, we can represent, so this guy can be represented a little bit different. So by some simple uh, sort of re uh, representation. Um, uh, yeah, right, so the representation that we can do, now we can get the following. So writing this guy, we can get the following. So we can get rho is equal, so we can write these three equations as a single equation, right? We, uh, with the vector rho and uh, the matrix, uh, and which, is, which multiplies cross the row, the same vector row. So that's essentially the single equation that describes uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, thing. When we have row, vector row, we can uh, write it as a u, v having three coordinates, u, v, and w, right? And, uh, and matrix row, uh, it's, it's a vector omega, we can write it as, uh, vector with Rabi frequency in the direction of u, which is this direction, right? So the excitation goes along vector u, right? And then we have zero here, and uh, we have uh, minus delta along the w axis. So if, if we have two vectors like that, okay, then, then three, so these three equations can be written by a single uh, vector equation. So this sign a single vector equation will be representing a certain vector that has coordinates in uh, u, v, v, w plane. And uh, the driving force will have uh, projections on two axes, on U and W uh, axis, and will have no projection on V axis. So essentially, when the delta is equal to zero, right, so I can, I can represent that, uh, so the start sort of uh, uh, geometrical representation of uh, what we are doing, of this uh, um, optical block equations, um, So let's have a uh, thinking, uh, let, let's make a geometrical we call representation of optical Bloch equations. Um, so this geometrical representation is actually given here, right? So we have now uh, axis which is W, U, and V, U, V, and W. So this is uh, now a, 
a vector, so now vector rho is a, is a Bloch vector, is a Bloch vector, right? Uh, according to optical Bloch equations, so rho is a Bloch vector, rho is a Bloch vector, and uh, omega is a driving vector, right? So it's a, it's a driver. So now this driver, um, how it, it, it goes, so now it's really, you know, look at this, uh, and this expression, so where the driver should be. So the driver should be along U axis, right, that's the driver frequency. And it also has the component along W, so this is the W. It also has the component along W, with the detuning uh, being uh, the uh, value of the projection of the driver on the W axis. So suppose that we have uh, on resonance interaction. Right? So on resonance uh, drive. So if it's on resonance drive, then we have the driving field is uh, really uh, 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 directed along uh, U axis. This is what is uh, what we have there. So only Rabi frequency, so, uh, you know, it's omega Rabi. Uh, so this is omega Rabi. And now, what, what this equation actually describes. Um, so this equation actually pre pre describes precession of uh, the vector around the driving field. Right, so as a function of time, that's that's this is what what this equation describes. Um, so this means that we actually can uh, uh, see that our block vector, which represents the difference between the populations, right? So we can uh, imagine where the uh, block vector has what is the direction of the block vector in the beginning. Well, right, so to the minus one, right. So this is the uh, block vector at time equal to zero, right? So before we apply the uh, uh, any any type of uh, modulation, so then uh, that's the row at uh, time t equal to zero, and then what is happening is that uh, applying this uh, modulation, we actually ca have to have this row vector stay in the, in the uh, uh, in, in, in the, uh, yeah, in the WV plane, uh, perpendicular to the uh, drive. And so this uh, row vector st start to rotate, right, and, and it makes uh, the full rotation uh, around the uh, omega Rabi uh, drive. So this means that we are actually rotating in this uh, plane, so it's rotate in this plane and goes down and rotate and, and continues uh, the full rotation in the UV, in the VW plane. So if we have, uh, you know, this type of the coordinate, something like uh, having this is like, uh, this is like U, V, but this is W, right? Me is the W, so this is the U and this is the V. So the drive is here, right? The vector well, the block vector is there, down, right? It's pointing down. Now it's rotate like that. Whoops, goes up, and then continues. <laughs> I don't, I cannot do that, right? So continues this way, like, <laughs> rotate there. But this is something like uh, like that, right? It rotates in this in this plane. So it's rotating in this plane perpendicular to the uh, to the drive field. So drive field is here, and then the, the optical block block vector rotates like that. So what's going on with this rotation? It means that you know the population goes from the ground state goes up fully in the excited state after the period, the, the half period. Remember that this is Rabi flopping that we saw a week ago in the solution that that was included only uh, the uh, population, the change of the population. So this is exactly the solution that we will see here if the tuning is equal to zero. Remember that when the tuning was equal to zero then uh, we were able to take the, the, the entire population from the ground state, which is now represented by a block vector, which is pointing down. And, uh, uh, 
South Pole. Then uh, we are getting it up in the North Pole and getting down back in the North Pole after the full uh, rotation and it continues. Rotate like that. Okay? So that's, uh, this is the, uh, the detuning equal to zero. What happening if the detuning is not equal to zero, right? So if detuning is now uh, is very, is, is very large, essentially, uh, even larger than uh, uh, the Rabi flopping, th than the Omega Rabi. Then uh, we have a different, uh, a different situation. So we have here U, V, and W. So now uh, the driving uh, vector is actually uh, going almost uh, along the W direction. Right? So now it's actually the question, what is the, the sign of the detuning? And let's suppose that this, it has a po positive sign. So then I have uh, uh, some, some value here. So this is the drive. The drive is somewhere, somewhere in the UW plane, and it's somewhere pointing down, sort of close to this, uh, to this axis, to the W axis. So the row vector is here. It's still minus one. This is the row vector. So now how it behaves? So it's still the precession, right? It's still the precession around the drive vector. This procession is now, uh, uh, you know, having, uh, you, you just uh, made a certain uh, uh, angle around this, right? So you just describe the uh, angle around that. Um, it, it goes like that. It processes around uh, the driving field. So it it's goes... Like, like, so that's, that's, that's the, uh, right, so that's the driver field. So if I'm uh, looking the same, talking the same language, so U, V, W, it's me. So now uh, the driving, instead of being in this direction, it's pointing in this direction, right? So the um, row vector was here, right? So it's pointing down. So I'm pointing down, now it starts to process yeah, instead of doing that, the full rotation, it's actually doing a small rotation around this, around this uh, vector. So it's processes like that. So if the, it's processes around the driving, driving field. So and this is essentially the same that we saw if we just consider only population. If you consider only, po if, if we consider only population, this means that um, the, the field, so, so the, the population was essentially uh, leaving just a little bit uh, the ground state, right? So the projection, uh, it was the projection on the population axis stays always on the ground state. Um, only a little bit uh, of the rotation goes to the excited state, right? So this is the projection because this, this projection means the difference between them. So it's depart from minus one, it goes a little bit up. It means that the excited population, the excited state starts to be populated, but it populated a little bit because we are essentially staying almost around the South Pole. So we are still sitting somewhere here. Going through the South Pole, right, always. It goes back to the South Pole because this is the initial condition. It goes to the South Pole and then boops. It goes like boop, boop, boop. And a little bit of the projection of that makes a small population. So it it's, it's processes faster than it was the procession in, in the case of delta equal to zero. <coughs> this precession is essentially at the frequency of the rubber frequency squared plus delta squared, square root of that. Um, but this precession is uh, essentially around the same point. So you don't, you don't make very big uh, rotations. So you make very uh, small precessions around the driving field. So essentially, uh, that describes the block sphere. So the block vector. Right, can be can should, can actually be pointing out in any U V W direction, right? So uh, the driver seems to be only uh, limited to uh, to W V plane, but that the, the the vector the block vector can point in any direction. So it doesn't change the the the, the total 
size, total length, total length is equal to 1, because u, but u squared plus w squared plus u squared plus v squared, u of t squared plus v squared of t plus w squared of t is equal to 1 if you don't put here 1 half. Okay, so if you put here there 1 half, then, then it's equal to 1 quarter. But if we don't put here 1 half, then this is the, uh, the requirement that the, the length of the, of the vector is always equal to uh, 1. And so, and then it it's just can point out in, 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 in a different direction of the block sphere. So it can be in all possible positions, pointing at all possible directions of the block sphere. <coughs> That's the language of the qubit. Essentially, the qubit is a two-level system with uh, the uh, possibility to uh, point it any different direction in, on, on the, the whole sphere, right? So uh, the classical, classical qubit, or classical bit, sorry, not qubit, classical bit has only two possibilities, to be either down or up, right? So only pointing south pole or, down or north pole. Um, quantum bit can point any direction Whatever you, whatever you wish, right? So it's just depend on your drive. So when depending on your drive, you can you can have any any possible uh, uh, position. So it, 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 what is the meaning of that? So the meaning of that is that if, if you get, for example, if you get your vector of block somewhere in the UV plane, so you, you position, you know, you project it somewhere here. So how do you do that? So in, in this situation, for example, right? So you you wait for the rotation, which is about a quarter of the period, and then you stop the rotation. You switch off the rabbit frequency. So you essentially uh, provide a superposition state of the ground of being on the ground state and on the exciting state. So you you, you create a, a pure state of the superposition of uh, being uh, in, the, in the ground state or an excited state. And then uh, you have uh, many uh, different things that you can uh, do, uh, starting from whatever direction you want. So we will talk about that uh, uh, next time uh, on, a different, uh, uh, on different meanings. So before even uh, producing, adding any type of uh, decay in the story. So the decay is not there still. So the decay will be there, so I will talk about the decay, we will plug in the decay in the story. But without the decay, so if you can neglect the decay in the story, somehow, so at least spontaneous emission, then you can drive your qubit and put it at any position in, uh, in the uh, uh, block sphere. Um, actually, essentially, it, uh, almost at any position. Well, well, at any position, not almost, at any position. So. It's only depend on the combination of your drive. So you can change the drive, and you can change the phase of the drive. So now the drive actually drives the, the uh, you can point only in the direction of W or U, right? In some, it's, it's also scan the U, W plane. But you can change its uh, direction also, and, and provide the direction of the uh, drive field also in the in the um, in the v, in the v direction so how to do that quite easy because we now know this formula so we know that the v is essentially the quadrature in uh, in your drive field it's in the quadrature of your drive field so only thing, if you want to to direct your drive field in the uh, direction of v you have to change the phase of your drive field by 90 degrees so instead of cosinus, go to sine, sine function. So you start, this is essentially a you know, photon lock scheme. Um, photon lock scheme, uh, the idea of this photon lock is uh, to make, so to, to provide a drive at 90 degrees, then to wait for the population to go into the UV plane. So this is the superposition of, between the ground state and the excited state. And then you switch off your drive and change the drive by 90 degrees and switch on the drive, which is in 90 degrees, uh, change the phase of it as compared to the initial drive. So boom, 
you direct it in this direction, and now your block vector cannot move anymore. It is locked. Okay. So it is locked in this direction by uh, what was named as a, as, as, as a photon lock. So you provide the drives, you provide the photons, but nothing changes. So the population do not change, coherences do not change, nothing changes, everything is locked, and uh, despite the presence of the drive that uh, try to excite the system. So it's really difficult to understand in different, uh, in different representation. On the block sphere, you start to get uh, a very intuitive understanding of uh, what's going on. So let's stop for the day here. Um, I will describe. I will still describe you uh, uh, the geometrical representation of uh, optical block equations. I want. I promised you to describe all the steps, like uh, rotating wave approximation and rotating wave frame. Um, I will describe you the geometrical uh, meaning of all these steps, and then we will be able to, uh, you know, we will talk a little bit about the uh, meaning of all this stuff. So essentially, we will talk about. So this this is also the basis of uh, atomic clocks. So I will talk. I will tell you a little bit about atomic clocks, and then we will add uh, decay. And we would be able to uh, understand essentially uh, even more what is the meaning of this in phase and in quadrature uh, response of dipole. So now, for the for the moment, we only need to remember that dipole has two responses: one response in phase and one response in quadrature to the driving field. Okay, so that's the essential results, and it can be represented on this sphere. That this sphere is a block sphere. Okay. Uh, can stop here.